Hi everyone, so this lecture is about the blood, which is the river of life as it transports everything that must be carried from one body part to another. As what we have mentioned previously, a cell needs many things in order to live. The essentials, oxygen, nutrients, and water, these are all carried by the blood to include hormones, waste products, and many more. So in this discussion, we will mainly focus on the composition and function of this life-sustaining fluid. What now are the physical characteristics and volume of blood? It's a fluid that is sticky and opaque. It has a metallic taste, so in case you ever tasted your blood before. Next is its color, which depends on how much oxygen it carries. If it is scarlet or bright red, the blood is oxygen rich. If it is dull red, it's oxygen poor. It is also heavier than water, five times, and it is more viscous. It's slightly alkaline. Normal pH is 7.35 to 7.45. The blood is also warm, it's 38 degrees, and it accounts for 8% of total body weight, which is approximately 5 to 6 liters in an average size adult. The components of blood, uh, although it appears to be thick and homogeneous, the microscope reveals that it has both solid and liquid components. It's unique. It's the only fluid tissue in the human body. But uh, the blood contains visible strands during clotting. This only happens when uh, the dissolved proteins become fibrin strands. And again, that occurs after bleeding when clotting happens. But uh, ideally, collagen and elastin fibers are absent from the blood. It contains plasma and formed elements. So there are four general components of the blood. There are three formed elements, the RBCs, the WBCs, and the platelets. If a sample of blood is separated, the plasma rises to the top and the formed elements being heavier fall to the bottom, as shown in the photo. So plasma is 55% of the total volume of our blood. WBCs and platelets comprise less than 1%, while RBCs are 45%. In general, what do these components of blood uh, are for? RBCs carry oxygen. WBCs are the immune cells. The platelets are important for blood clotting, while the plasma, it carries more than 100 substances such as hormones, nutrients, among others. So now let us uh, briefly discuss each of these components of blood. The plasma is mostly water. It's approximately 90% water. It's straw-colored fluid, and it contains over 100 substances. These include nutrients, salts or electrolytes, the gases, the hormones, the plasma proteins, and waste products from cell metabolism. The plasma proteins are the most abundant solutes in the plasma. It's made by the liver, except for the antibodies and the protein-based hormones. If we try to think of the word protein, we would think of it as a source of energy for growth and development, but this is not taken up by cells to be used as food fuels or metabolic nutrients. Plasma proteins are not like that. The ones serving for... Uh, as a food fuel are those which we call glucose, the fatty acids, and oxygen, but not the plasma proteins. So what then are the plasma proteins if they are not used as food fuels or as metabolic nutrients? 
the plasmaproteins are the albumin, the clotting proteins, and the antibodies. Albumin acts as a carrier to shuttle certain molecules through circulation. It's a very important blood buffer, and it contributes to osmotic pressure of blood, which acts to keep water in the bloodstream. Because it's very important to consider that, again, the plasma contains more than 100 substances. The clotting proteins function to stem blood loss, especially when the vessels are injured. And lastly, the antibodies help protect the body from pathogens. They are important as immune proteins of the body. The other components of blood are the formed elements, which are the erythrocytes, the RBCs, the leukocytes, the WBCs, and the platelets. Erythrocytes function primarily to carry oxygen to all cells of the body. They are also called red blood cells or RBCs. They are small, flexible cells and shaped like biconcave discs. It lacks nucleus and mitochondria, and they contain very few organelles. Now, the mature RBCs, which are circulating in the blood, are literally bags of hemoglobin molecules. Hemoglobin is the main component of an RBC. And take note that a single RBC has 250 million hemoglobin molecules or equivalent to 12 to 18 grams per 100 ml of blood. It's an iron-bearing protein which transports most of the oxygen to the cell. That's why very important that our diet is uh, filled with enough iron in the body. Kasi kung kulang tayo sa iron, hindi ganun ka-effective si hemoglobin sa pag-carry ng oxygen. There are about 5 million RBCs per cubic ml of blood. So ganito kadami ang kailangan natin so that we can carry effectively the oxygen and be able to deliver oxygen to all cells of the body. In this photo now, we can see the side view and the top view microscopically of an RBC. As mentioned previously, biconcave yung disc niya. One RBC has two alpha and two beta chains. No? These are the hemoglobin chains, each carrying one oxygen atom. So there are four oxygen atoms in a single uh, hemoglobin chain. And as mentioned kanina, we have about 250 million hemoglobin chains in a single RBC. So imagine how many oxygen molecules it can carry. What happens when there are homeostatic imbalances of the erythrocytes? For one, there's anemia. There are several types of anemia. Take note that a decrease in the oxygen-carrying ability of the blood, whatever the reason is, is called anemia. First, if there is a decrease in the RBC number, which is due to sudden hemorrhage or bleeding, we call that hemorrhagic anemia. If there's a decrease in RBC number because of destruction of RBCs, mostly by pathogens such as bacteria, you call that hemolytic anemia. Another is a decrease in RBC because there is insufficient vitamin B12 or cyanocobalamin. It's, it's the intrinsic factor important to be able to absorb the vitamin. And uh, that intrinsic factor is formed by the stomach or the GI tract. If there is uh, such a reason, we call that pernicious anemia. And lastly, if there is a decrease in RBC number because of uh, the actual destruction or depression of the bone marrow. Remember, the bone marrow produces RBC because there is cancer or maybe radiation or certain medication effects 
we call that a plastic anemia. Another cause of anemia is because of inadequate hemoglobin content. And obviously, a lack of iron in diet or a slowly uh, prolonged bleeding, such as heavy menstrual flow or there's an internal bleeding, there could be an iron deficiency anemia. And lastly, there could be anemia because of abnormal hemoglobin in the RBCs. Genetic defects, which lead to abnormal hemoglobin, uh, is a cause. And that is sickle cell anemia, wherein the RBCs become sharp and sickle-shaped under certain conditions which uh, increase oxygen use by the body and uh, there is problems of carrying oxygen. On the other hand, polycythemia is the excessive or abnormal increase in RBCs. Polycythemia vera from bone marrow cancer or uh, secondary polycythemia vera as a normal physiologic response to living at high altitudes where air is thinner and less oxygen is available are the usual causes. Next are the leukocytes. Leukocytes, also called the white blood cells, are less numerous than RBCs. On the average, there's only 4,000 to 11,000 of it per cubic millimeters of blood. It's the only complete cells in the blood that is uh, because they have nucleus and the usual organelles. Now, the leukocytes form a protective movable army that helps defend body against pathogens. So these are our immune cells. As such, they have some very specific or special characteristics. Number one, Leukocytes can slip in and out of the blood. We call that diapidesis. It's the means of transportation to areas of the body where their services are needed for inflammatory or immune responses. The RBCs cannot do that. RBCs stay in the blood vessel. But the leukocytes can slip out. Second, they can locate areas of tissue damage and infection by responding to certain chemicals that they fuse from the damaged cells. It's a process called positive chemotaxis. So in this case, they can move through the tissue spaces in an amoeboid motion. They can pinpoint areas of tissue damage and rally around in the large numbers. And lastly, they ingest and eliminate pathogens through phagocytosis. They now destroy microorganisms and dispose of the dead cells. So, to make the story short, if you have an infection in a certain body area, your white blood cells are responsible for the healing process. So, ano dapat ang mangyari? Dun sa certain body area mo na may infection, dapat makarating doon ang white blood cells. Pero paano sila makakarating doon if the white blood cells are being carried within the blood? Number one, they can slip out of the blood. Kaya nilang lumabas from the blood vessel. Diapidesis. Number two, pagkalabas nila ng blood, kaya nilang hanapin kung nasaan yung tissue damage. Makakarating sila sa area of your body which is infected. You call that chemothaxis. At pangatlo, pag nakarating na sila sa lugar kung nasa saan yung pathogen, they will perform phagocytosis, destroy the microorganism, and therefore dispose of or heal pagagalingin ka from the infection. WBCs are all phagocytes, but they are classified into two major groups. 
granulocytes and the agranulocytes, depending on whether or not they contain visible granules in their cytoplasm. So the granulocytes are the basophils, neutrophils, and eosinophils. The agranulocytes are the macrophages and the lymphocytes. Macrophage is a mature monocyte, while lymphocytes are of two kinds, the T cells and the B cells, or the T lymphocytes and the B lymphocytes. So in general, there are five leukocytes. Again, the basophils, the neutrophils, the eosinophils, the macrophages, and the lymphocytes. Now, students are often asked to list the WBCs in order of relative abundance in the blood. Sinong pinakamarami at sinong pinakakonti? From most to least. The following phrase may help you with this task. Never let monkeys eat bananas. N for neutrophils, L for lymphocytes, M for macrophages, E for eosinophils, and B for basophils. First of the leukocytes are the neutrophils. They account for 40 to 75% of blood leukocytes. It's responsible for phagocytosis, literally meaning cell eating, important or very specific for short-term or acute infection. The neutrophils are very effective phagocytes. Why? Because the neutrophils, sila yung pinakamarami na WBC. Kung sila yung pinakamarami, sila yung pinakamabilis makarating doon sa site of injury or infection. That's why they are best for short-term or acute infections. Neutrophils are also very particularly effective sa bacteria and fungi. Neutrophils cannot replicate. They die following phagocytosis. Now, the accumulation of dead neutrophils contributes to the formation of pus when there is an infection. In the photo, you will see band neutrophils and segmented neutrophils. Band neutrophils are immature neutrophils, while segmented neutrophils are the mature ones. Sa isang complete blood count result, sometimes there are terms we see as segmenters. And the segmenters are actually the mature neutrophils, which again are very important for short-term or acute infections. Next are eosinophils, which account for only 2 to 5% of the leukocytes. They are also phagocytic because all WBCs are phagocytes, but they are not as effective as neutrophils. Why? If you look at their numbers, ang konti lang ng eosinophils compared sa napakaraming neutrophils. But its one significant function is it dampens down the inflammatory response and decrease granulocyte migration into the inflammatory site. Ibig sabihin, isa siya sa important na leukocytes para magsabing enough na yung nagpupuntang WBC doon sa site of infection. It's very significant sa mga parasitic infections and also even with allergic reactions. The basophils comprise less than 2% of total leukocytes, just somehow close to how many the eosinophils are. Inflammatory mediator siya. So again, when we say inflammation, we have to remember the inflammatory signs. Rubor for redness, dolor for pain, tumor for a swelling, calor for warmth or heat, and loss of function. Basophils release histamine. Ito ay isang inflammatory chemical that 
mix the blood vessels dilate and leaky. It attracts other WBCs to the inflammatory site. Initially, when wound healing occurs, blood vessels would need to dilate. Dahil kailangan pag lumuwag ang blood vessel, mas marami yung WBC na makakatravel. It also contains heparin, that's an anticoagulant, which prevents also the bleeding process. The lymphocytes are the smallest in size. They have a large dark purple nucleus and comprises 20 to 35% of the total leukocytes. Ang mga lymphocytes originate from stem cells in bone marrow just how the other blood components uh, are. But they differentiate into either two, the T or the B cells. Both are responsible for immune response. B lymphocytes produce antibodies. B is basically for humoral immunity. It's antibody-driven adaptive immunity. On the other hand, yung T lymphocytes naman, it's involved in graft rejection and also in fighting tumors and viruses. T is for cell-mediated cytotoxic and adaptive immunity. Okay, now the lymphocytes are either the B or the T cells. So again, both of them came from the bone marrow. Pero si B lymphocyte, nung nagmature siya, naging B lymphocyte siya, still from the bone marrow. But yung T lymphocyte na nanggaling ng bone marrow, kaya nga siya T. Because nung nagmature siya, kinailangan niya yung tulong ng thymosine from the thymus gland. Recalling what we have learned in the endocrine system. The lymphocytes are either any of the four different kinds. One is yung cytotoxic or killer cells. From the name itself, cytotoxic or killer kills the infection. The second type of lymphocytes are the helper cells or the T helper cells. And from the name of the lymphocytes itself, they are helpers. And without all of these helping each other, hindi magiging effective yung pag-fight sa infection, tumor, or other pathogens. Memory cells are the third type of lymphocytes. Pag sinabing memory cells, again, from the word memory, kaya niyang kilalanin yung mga previous infection, that's why kapag na-encounter niya ulit ito, kayang-kaya ng labanan ito ng ating immune system. And uh, if you recall, no, minsan sinasabi sa atin na yung nagkaroon na ng mga chicken pox before, there is a less chance of having chicken pox again. Mainly because the memory cells know already that these viruses have been with uh, this body before. Kaya kaya na niyang labanan dahil nakadevelop na rin siya dito ng antibodies which are actually the B lymphocytes. And lastly, uh, the fourth type of lymphocytes are the suppressor or the regulator cells. So from suppressor or regulator, the word itself, siya din yung nagre-regulate ng enough inflammatory reaction for every type of infection or pathogen. So again, the four lymphocytes are the cytotoxic or killer, the helper, the memory, and the suppressor or regulator. The last type of the leukocytes are the monocytes. 
monocytes are the largest in size and they account for 2 to 6% of the total leukocytes. Monocytes circulate in the blood when they migrate to the tissues, nagiging macrophage. Macrophages are big eaters. And dahil nga monocytes, pag naging macrophage, are very, very big. Kaya sila ay mga big eaters at magaling sila ngayon sa chronic infections such as tuberculosis. So going back, neutrophils are very good for acute infections because pinakamarami sila, pinakamabilis pumunta sa site of injury. But the monocytes are very good for chronic infections kasi pinakamalaki sila pinakamagaling yung nagagawa nilang proseso ng pagkain or phagocyte as the big eater itself. Looking at this photo, phagocytosis uh, is being depicted in this uh, several steps. So first, the phagocyte, the monocyte, being the largest of them all, approaches the antigen. So, si antigen, yan yung protein ng foreign body. And then, ine-engulf niya, dinadigest, hanggang sa magkaroon ng completion ng phagocytosis. This is a very good characteristic of how leukocytes fight infections or how leukocytes serve as the immune cells of our body. Some homeostatic imbalances of the leukocytes are also based on its count or number. Leukocytosis is high WBC, usually because of bacterial or viral infections. Tumataas kasi kinakailangan na marami yung lumaban sa pathogen. Leukopenia or low WBC count commonly caused by certain drugs such as corticosteroids and anti-cancer drugs. Bakit bumababa ang WBC sa leukopenia? Because these drugs cause bone marrow suppression as a side effect, lalo na ang mga chemotherapy drugs. When they cause bone marrow suppression, kumukonti din yung napuproduce niya na WBC because bone marrows produce them. And lastly, leukemia. The bone marrow becomes cancerous and huge numbers of RBC are turned out rapidly. And these WBCs proliferate but they are not really effective when it comes to immune cells or immune function. The third of the formed elements are the platelets. They are not cells in the strict sense, but they are fragments of bizarre multinucleate cells which we call megakaryocytes. They appear darkly staining under the microscope, irregular ang shape niya, and it's about 300,000 per cubic millimeters in average. Platelets are needed for normal blood clotting. And this clotting process stops blood from broken blood vessels. Ito ay napaka-importante process ng hemostasis. When we say hemostasis, ito yung body's attempt to stop bleeding. Take note that wound healing cannot begin without hemostasis. It's the first stage of wound healing. Ang hemostasis, it's a process to prevent or stop bleeding and that involves coagulation. Ibig sabihin nun, blood changing from liquid to a gel. And in the photo, you can see nagkaroon ng injury. No? And then, after the injury, nandodoon yung mga platelets, nagkaroon ng clotting, 
Therefore, from a liquid to a gel, hihinto ang pagdurugo from the outside. Discussing the concept of hemostasis, normally, blood flows smoothly past the intact lining of the blood vessel walls. But if a blood vessel wall breaks, nagkakaroon ng series of reaction to start the process of hemostasis again to stop bleeding. Itong response na ito is uh, fast and localized. It involves many substances normally present in plasma, as well as some that are released by the platelets and the injured tissue cells. Let us take into consideration in the photo, hemostasis involves three major phases. First is yung vascular spasm. Nagkakaroon ng smooth muscle contraction. Nagkakos ng vasoconstriction. Pag nagkaroon ng vasoconstriction, mababawasan yung pagdurugo. The second is the platelet plug formation. The platelet plug formation is when there is injury to the lining of the vessel, uh, exposes collagen fibers, nagkakaroon ng platelet adherence. So, si platelet na -re release and the uh, chemicals that make the nearby uh, platelets become sticky, nagkakaroon ng platelet plug formation. And lastly, yung coagulation events occur. The clotting factors present in the plasma na -re release siya by the injured tissues and then uh, the enzyme no, that catalyzes joining the fibrinogen molecules in plasma nagiging fibrin. Si fibrin nagpo-form ng mesh at nagtatrap yon ng RBCs and platelet kaya nagpo-form ng clot. So again, hemostasis is complete. And after that happens, wala na yung bleeding. And then the next steps of wound healing will now occur. What are some of the homeostatic imbalances when we deal with hemostasis? If there is undesirable clotting, thrombus or embolus forms. Thrombus is a blood clot in any unbroken blood vessel. Nagiging embolus siya if a thrombus breaks away from the vessel and floats freely in the bloodstream. Ang delikado sa embolus dahil maliliit yan na mga clot, it can travel doon sa mga maliliit na blood vessels ng ating cardiopulmonary system, especially the pulmonary System. Pag nagkaroon ng pulmonary embolus at uh, yung maliit na clot na yan ay bumara dyan sa ating airway or dun sa ating uh, blood vessel affecting the cardiovascular system, nahihirapan tayong huminga and it's actually a medical emergency. Bleeding disorders are either thrombocytopenia, petechiae, and hemophilia. Thrombocytopenia is a platelet deficiency. That's why delikado ito na magkaroon ng continuous bleeding pag tayo ay nasugatan. Petechiae are small purplish blotches on the skin. It may signify an internal bleeding. While hemophilia, it's a hereditary bleeding disorder due to lack of factors needed for clotting. And uh, hemophilia usually occurs uh, among males dahil ito ay isang sex-linked recessive trait. What about blood cell formation? Blood cell formation occurs in the red bone marrow found in flat bones of skull and pelvis, ribs, sternum, and usually the proximal epiphysis of the humerus and femur. On the average, we produce one ounce of new blood every day. 
This is approximately equivalent to 30 ml of blood every day, which contains 100 billion new cells. At lahat ng formed elements, what are the formed elements? RBC, WBC, and platelet. They arise from a common type of stem cell called the hemocystoblast. In the photo, we see the hemocystoblast stem cell. Now, there are two types of hemocystoblast stem cells, the lymphoid stem cells and the myeloid stem cells. Ang mga lymphoid stem cells nagpoproduce siya ng lymphocyte, while the myeloid stem cells produce all the rest of the formed elements, which are the RBCs, the WBCs, except the lymphocytes and the platelets. Okay? Now, if we recall, there is a cancer called leukemia. At ang leukemia ay abnormal proliferation ng WBCs. Kaya meron din dalawang klase ng leukemia. It's either lymphocytic leukemia or myelogenous leukemia. Kung lymphocytic leukemia, it means the affected stem cell is the lymphoid stem cell, only affecting the production of lymphocytes. While if there is myelogenous leukemia, it affects the myeloid stem cell, which produces all of the other formed elements except the lymphocytes. So, thinking about it, parehong delikado ang leukemia, but obviously, the myelogenous uh, leukemia has a very poor prognosis. Some hormones help in the production of our blood cells. Erythropoietin is the hormone which helps production of RBCs. CSFs and interleukins are hormones which stimulates production of WBCs. And lastly, thrombopoietin is a hormone which stimulates production of platelets. Let us now go to blood groups and transfusions. There are over 30 common RBC antigens in humans. So each person's blood cells can be classified into several different blood groups. However, it is the antigens of the A, B, O, and RH blood groups that cause the most vigorous transfusion reactions. So here, we will be describing these two groups that we have the ABO blood group and the RH blood group. The ABO blood groups are based on which two antigens a person inherits from the parents, father, and mother. So it's either type A or type B. Absence of both antigens result in type O blood. Pero pag Pareho kang meron ng antigen, type AB. Or, maaring meron ka ng A lang, type A, or B lang, type B. It yields to these blood types respectively. So, we have the type A, type B, type AB, and type O. Now, what are antigens and antibodies? Antigens are genetically determined proteins in the RBC membrane and they stimulate the immune system to produce antibodies. Antibodies, on the other hand, are present in the plasma that attaches to RBC after recognizing an antigen. Antibodies are immunoglobulins which identify and neutralize foreign objects such as pathogenic bacteria, fungi. So pag may infection, yung antibody, it recognizes the unique molecule of the pathogen, which is the antigen of that 
pathogen. And foreign objects would also include a blood type that is different from your own, depending on the antigen you have and the antibody you produce. To keep this idea straight, tatandaan, antibodies against a person's own blood type will not be produced. Ibig sabihin, if your blood type A, your antigen is A. If your blood type B, your antigen is B. If your blood type AB, your antigens are A and B. And if your blood type O, you do not have these antigens, which means, again, kung meron ka ng specific type of antigen na yun, hinding-hindi ka gagawa ng antibody para doon. Your own cells will not kill your own. So if you have a blood type A, dahil may A antigen ka, anong antibody lang ang kayang iproduce ng iyong plasma? The anti-B. Hindi ka magkakaroon ng anti-A. Kung blood type B ka, dahil meron kang B antigen sa iyong RBC, ang kaya mo lang iproduce anti-A. Hindi ka magkakaroon ng anti-B. Why? Kasi kung blood type A ka, hindi ka gagawa ng anti-A because it will not kill your own. Kung blood type B ka, hindi ka gagawa ng anti-B because you will not kill your own. Kung blood type AB ka ngayon, dahil pareho kang may A and B antigen, of course, you do not have any antibodies in your plasma. And lastly, if you have no antigens in your blood, dito, dahil wala kang antigen, so para sa'yo, foreign ang A and B. And because it's foreign, kaya mo siyang produce ng anti-A and anti-B. In this case, we will now realize ano yung mga dugo na kaya kong tanggapin at ano yung mga dugo na kaya kong i-donate when we are talking about blood transfusions. Again, if you are blood type A, your antigen is A. Your antibody, anti-B. So, kaya mong tumanggap ng dugo na blood type A at blood type O. Kasi ang blood type A, wala namang anti-A. Pero kapag blood type O yung tinanggap mo, dahil wala naman siyang antigen, hindi mo madedetect na may foreign doon. Kaya mong mag-donate sa A and AB. Bakit kaya mong mag-donate sa AB? Because a blood type, a person with a blood type AB, will not produce any antibodies against any blood type. On the other hand, if you're blood type B, meron kang B antigen, ang kayang iproduce ng katawan mo are anti-A only. So, kaya mong tumanggap ng blood type B, obviously, kasi pareho kayo ng blood type, and blood type O. Again, because if you receive a blood, which is blood type O, wala naman siyang antigen. So, wala kang madedetect na something foreign, you will not develop antibodies. You can only donate to a blood type B and AB. Why AB again? You can donate your blood type B to an AB patient because this patient will never develop any antibodies. Kung blood type AB ka naman, because you both have the A and the B antigen, you will never develop any antibodies. And because of that, you can receive blood type from any blood and can only donate to AB. Kasi yun lang yung kapareho mo na blood type. Other than that, uh, maaaring magproduce ng antibody yung iba. And blood type O, because you have no antigen, you can only receive blood only from a blood type O person only. You can donate to 
any blood type because you have no antigen and these people who will receive the blood type O will never detect an antigen, hence will never produce antibody to it. Kaya kung titignan natin, safest pa rin talaga yung the same blood type. Ang A, B is actually the universal recipient. Kaya niyang tanggapin lahat ng blood type kasi hindi naman siya magpo-produce ng antibody. Ang universal donor naman is O. No, dahil kaya niyang magbigay ng blood type sa kahit anong blood type dahil wala naman siyang antigen. Another human blood group is the RH blood. The RH blood groups are so named because of one of the eight RH antigens or the agglutinogen D. It was originally identified in rhesus monkeys, hence RH. Later, the same antigen was discovered in humans. So, ngayon, if you have the D antigen, ikaw ay positive. And again, will your body produce anti-D if you have the antigen? So, no antibody. But, if you do not have the antigen, ikaw ay negative. And again, pwede kang magproduce ng anti-D because you are not familiar with the antigen. Hence, your body will form an antibody to fight it. Most humans are RH positive, meaning their RBCs carry the RH antigen. But unlike yung antibodies ng no ABO system, anti-RH antibodies are not automatically formed by RH individuals. No? However, if an RH negative person receives an RH positive blood, shortly after the transfusion, his or her immune system becomes sensitized. Tapos nag-uumpisa siyang magproduce ng anti-RH antibodies against the foreign blood type. In the photo, you can see here a pregnant woman. Because very significant ang RH blood group sa isang babaeng buntis. If you look at the photo, the mother is RH negative. Ibig sabihin, wala siyang antigen. At yung baby are, are, is RH positive. Ibig sabihin, meron siyang D antigen. Saan nang galing yung D antigen nung baby? Of course, obviously, it came from the father. So what will be the condition here? If the mother is RH positive, maaari siyang uh, magkaroon ng RH positive din na baby. And that's okay. But if the mother is RH negative at nagkaroon siya ng baby na RH positive, maaari siyang magproduce ng anti-D. Which means, kung nagproduce siya ng anti-D, maaari niyang madestroy ang RBCs ng baby niya. When will the mother sensitize that there is a positive antigen? Kailan ma detect ng katawan ng nanay na bakit merong D antigen dito sa katawan ko? Hindi ko naman to kilala. Usually, na detect ito when there is bleeding. A pregnant woman normally does not bleed. Nagkakaroon lang ng bleeding during birth. So therefore, pag pinanganak na yung bata, lumabas yung batang yan from the mother's womb, doon nagkaroon ng sensitization. Therefore, the baby is safe. Alright? But, take note, paglabas ng baby yan, this is the first pregnancy. Paglabas ng baby niyan, na-detect na nung mommy na may RH positive antigen. Kaya gumagawa na ngayon siya ng mga anti-D. In about 72 hours, kumpleto na ang anti-D sa katawan ng nanay niya yan. Ngayon, 
anong susunod na mangyayari? The baby is safe, lumabas na siya, nagproduce yung mami ng anti-D, pero nakalabas na yung baby, wala nang i-destroy yung anti-D. But after two years, nabuntis na naman ang nanay na ito. Ganun ulit, yung baby niya positive ulit sa D antigen which came from the father. So what will now happen? Nabubuo pa lang yung baby niya, dinedestroy na nung antibodies nung mommy to the D antigen yung nabubuong baby. That's why maaring magkaroon ng erythroblastosis fetalis. The anti-D of the mother destroys the D antigen of the growing fetus. Mamamatay ang baby niya. And that happens with succeeding pregnancies. Kasi nabuo ng nana yung anti-D sa loob ng katawan after the first pregnancy na RH positive si fetus. Would we want that? Of course, no. That's why if you're pregnant for the first time, inaalam ang RH ng babae, at kapag nangyari yon RH negative yung babae, maari siyang bigyan ng rogam. No? It's an immunoglobulin to prevent formation of anti-D and save the succeeding pregnancies. So dapat within 72 hours na ibibigay yung rogam. And that rogam is given, again, to prevent the bad effects of producing the anti-D with succeeding pregnancies. What about blood typing? The importance of determining the blood group of both the donor and the recipient before blood in stress fuse is glaringly obvious. Dahil kung mali ang blood type na ibibigay mo sa taong nangangailangan ng blood transfusion, obviously, magkaroon ng transfusion reaction or magpuproduce siya ng mga antibody against the blood antigen, the antigen of the RBC na tinatransfuse sa patient. Preventing transfusion reactions or hemolysis are very important when it comes to blood typing because these are fatal. The general procedure for determining ABO blood type essentially involves testing the blood no? by mixing it with three different types of immune serum anti-A, anti-B, and anti-D. Okay, ano ba yung agglutination? It's the binding of the antibodies. It causes the foreign RBC to clump. Yung agglutinogen, si RBC antigen, nagpo-promote ng clumping. Si agglutinins, yung antibodies ang nagpo-bind together. So, uh, looking at the photo, we can see here, sa type A blood, na pinataka ng anti-A and anti-B serum, nagkaroon ng agglutinated RBC. Nag-clot yung dugo. Ibig sabihin, kung ikaw ay blood type A, pinatakan ka ng anti-A serum, mag-aagglutinate. So, which means, blood type A yan. Kung ikaw ay blood type B, pinatakan ng anti-B serum yung blood smear at nag-clot, ibig sabihin, blood type B ka. Okay? Kaya yung pareho na blood smear na nakitang may agglutination, pinataka ng anti-A, pinataka ng anti-B, pareho nag-clot, ibig sabihin, pareho kang may antigen. And the same goes with blood type B. If you look at the photo in the blood type B, Yung dalawang smear na yan, dun sa glass slide ng type B ay patak ng dugo ng taong blood type B. Nung pinatakan siya ng anti-A, walang nangyaring agglutination. Ibig sabihin, walang antigen kasi hindi siya nag-clot. Pero yung blood type B, nung pinatakan ng anti-B, nag-clot. 
So, blood type B siya. Next, the third um, glass slide is the glass slide of a person who is blood type A. So, again, looking at the photo, yung first blood smear, dahil blood type A siya, pinata ka ng anti-A nag-clot. Dahil blood type A siya, pinata ka ng anti-B, hindi yan magka-clot. Kasi, wala naman siya nung antigen na yun. And lastly, the fourth glass slide is the glass slide of a person with blood type O. So, yung dalawang blood smears niya, pinata ka ng anti-A, pinata ka ng anti-B. Walang nangyari, hindi nag-clot, walang clumping, walang agglutination. Kasi, parehong walang antigen A, walang antigen B. So, anong blood type niya? Blood type O. Alright? Here, let us um, briefly discuss the steps kung paano ba talaga yung blood typing. So again, ideally, in the laboratory, we prepare a glass slide and the glass slide, we put it uh, accordingly, magkakatabi sa isang glass slide. So yung unang-una is the blood smear, napapataka natin ng anti-A serum. Pangalawa is the blood smear, napapataka natin ng anti-B serum. At yung pangatlo, glass uh, blood smear, napapataka natin ng anti-D serum. So, to determine kung merong antigen A, may antigen B, or may RH antigen. Second step is, put 1 to 2 drops of blood of IgG and IgM immunoglobulin reagents, anti-A, anti-B, and anti-D or RH, into each of the three blood smears respectively. There are standard colors. Ito yung mga immunoglobulin or the reagents. So, yung kulay blue, that's the anti-A serum. Yung kulay yellow, that's the anti-B serum. And yung white is the anti-D or anti-RH serum. Again, these are antibodies. Magkakaroon lang ng agglutination kung meron ka nung antigen na yon. So, papatakan, 1 to 2 drops, yung 3 smears. Third, nung napatakan mo na ng reagent, yung bawat smear, Mix each blood smear with a reagent using a sterile or clean stick. Tapos, hiintayin mo na ngayon kung magkakaroon ng agglutination. Paano natin ulit malalaman kung may agglutination or clumping? Doon sa unang photo, no clumping. Kahit pinatakan mo nung antibody na reagent, walang clumping, ibig sabihin, wala siya nung reagent na yon. Pero pag may clumping, Ibig sabihin, kung ano yung pinatak mo sa kanya at nag-clump yung dugo, meron siya nung antigen na yon. Therefore, nandu doon yun sa blood type niya. So, in the uh, slide below, again, yan yung three smears ng dugo sa isang glass slide. Yung unang ipinatak, anti-A. Pangalawang ipinatak, anti-B. Pangatlong pinatak, anti-D. Kung titignan nyo, lahat yung tatlo may agglutination, which means meron siyang A antigen. Meron din siyang B antigen. At meron din siya nung D antigen. So, ano ang blood type nitong taong ito? A, B, positive. A, kasi nag sa anti-A. B kasi nag-clot dun sa anti-B. And positive kasi nag-clot sa anti-D. So, A, B, positive. Let's have other examples here. Sample 1 is a blood type A positive. Bakit? May clumping sa anti-A. So, may A antigen siya. Walang clumping sa anti-B. So, wala siyang B antigen. 
nag-clump ulit sa anti-RH. So, meron siyang D antigen. So, blood type ng sample 1, A positive. Let's now look at the sample 2. Sa anti-A, walang clumping. So, wala siyang A antigen. Sa anti-B, may clumping. So, may B antigen siya. Sa anti-RH, nag-clump ulit. So, meron siyang D antigen. Anong blood type ng sample 2? B positive. And lastly, sample 3, nag-clot sa anti-A, nag-clump, may agglutination, so may A antigen. Yung anti-B na antibody na pinatak doon sa second smear, ganun ulit. Nag-clump yung dugo, so may B antigen. Pero sa anti-RH, hindi nag-clump walang agglutination, so wala siyang D antigen. Kaya ang blood type ng sample 3, AB negative. As uh, we have seen, blood is really vital for transporting substances through the body. When blood is lost, yung ating blood vessels nagko-constrict muna, as mentioned kanina, no? Kasi, uh, yung bone marrow nag-step up ng blood cell formation in a, an attempt to maintain circulation. However, the body can only compensate for a loss of blood volume only up to a certain limit. Kapag mga 15 to 30% ang nawala sa ating dugo, tayo ay magkakaroon ng pallor and weakness. Loss of over 30% causes severe shock, which can really be fatal. Anong klaseng shock? Hypovolemic shock. That's why whole blood transfusions are routinely given to replace substantial blood loss. Your usual blood bank procedure, it involves collecting the blood from a donor, mix it with anticoagulant to prevent clotting muna, Tapos, the blood is treated, no? it can be stored at 4 degrees Celsius until needed for about 35 days. Yun yung mga kinukuha nating dugo sa blood bank. Pwedeng ibigay ang fresh whole blood, usually for 4 hours. Pack RBC for 4 hours. Fresh frozen plasma for 4 hours. And platelet concentrate for 1 hour which means beyond those hours, pag wala na sa blood bank or wala na doon sa freezer na 4 degrees Celsius, napapanis yung dugo. Kaya ang dugo, pag dinala sa ating nurses from the blood bank, malamig siya. That's why we warm it. In order to double check compatibility also, cross-matching is also done. That's very important. Cross-matching involves testing for agglutination of donor RBCs by the recipient's serum and of the recipient's RBCs by the donor serum. So, blood typing and cross-matching are done prior to uh, giving the blood via the blood transfusions. That's the end of our topic on blood.